This is Debrief, brought to you by the Australian Industry Group. Yes, indeed. Hello and welcome back to Debrief, AI Group's monthly podcast on the recent developments in Australian industry policy and what it means for you and your business, especially in terms of the three critical aspects of today's changing world, the three Ds, digitalization, decarbonisation, and the diversification of your business operations to ensure we are no longer subject to single points of failure or unnecessary risks or disruptions. That's right, debrief, a briefing on the three Ds. My name is James Scotland, and with me, as always, to unpack the issues of the month as only she can, is the guru, my co-host, an industry policy specialist and the head of industry policy and development for the Australian Industry Group, Louise McGrath. Hi, Louise. Hi, James. It's been another busy month, Louise, and we've got lots to talk about. I think the issue we have to start with, though, is the issue du jour. We're recording this on Thursday, the 4th of July, and that means that the UK is about to go to uh, federal elections or national elections, and it looks like they're going to have a change of government for the first time in a long time. Meanwhile, in France, uh, they're in their second round of uh, election e- elections, and it looks like that there's going to be a populist far-right protectionist government in place, if possibly a minority, but still forming a government. And in India, Modi has been successful in being returned, but with a reduced minority, uh, reduced majority, which means that he may not be able to implement as much as he would like. It's a changing world. I think this feels like it's going to affect Australia a lot, all these changes. Can you put some context around it for us, please, Louise? What's it all mean according to you? Well, I, I think you're right, James. It is, well, a return to populism. I mean, technically in a democracy, you would expect always the popular people to, to Yeah, well, it's to, a bit um, of a strange win. term, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, you elected someone um, popular. But if we look at, at sort of the language of populism, you know, of this sort of populism and far right being, you know, anti-migrant and, and it's, you know, within Europe and, and not that in India it's anti-migrant, but, but there's a lot of, you know, Hindu nationalist language. There's a lot of, um, you know, highlighting minorities, et cetera. So there's, there's a lot of similarities, you know, wherever, whatever part of the world there is. I think it's just a challenge of Western democracies that we've had it so good for so long. We've forgotten. We've forgotten all the lessons, you know, as humans tend to do. And if you look, if you think about it, you know, if we think about the, the global rules based order, you know, that liberalized our economies, that opened up trade routes, reduced poverty worldwide, lifted people, um, created jobs and opportunities for people, made goods cheaper, just connected us, um, in a much more, re- I mean, we've always been connected by trade, but really, entwining our economies together. That was in response to, you know, those horrendous wars of the last century and, you know, protectionism and a whole lot of sort of economic evils that we all needed to stand up and fight against and advocating for rule of law, for democracy, for open and fair trade will, will really underpin the last 50 years of growth. Now, we're losing that. So you'd have to say, well, if it was so good, why? Why, why are people turning against it? Mm. Do they not mm. know, you know, what's good for them, which is a bit paternalistic? The analogy I would use is a bit like surviving a plane crash. So on a successful plane crash, no one dies, but you use the exit slides and everyone's, you know, everyone slides down, everyone survives. Th- at least 3% of those passengers are going to have an injury, friction burns, Broken wrists, sprained ankles, etc. Mm-hmm. So, in the first few days, well, the first day of that plane crash, you, the adrenaline, the euphoria is going. You think, oh, thank God, we survived that plane crash. You know how fantastic. After a few days, the people with the broken legs, that the, the sprained wrists, etc., they're going to start moaning. And it's not about ignoring them, but it's about how you support them. the The, the rules based order of open and fair trade was not painless. There were people who lost jobs. You know, in Australia, we had people within the textile and automotive industries who lost jobs. The thing isn't about protecting, making sure that people don't lose jobs. It, the thing is that we, it's how we protect, how you support them in that transition and how you create an environment where 
they and their families are still supported and still part of the economy. So I think this is the challenge as we push forward and sort of looking at why this populism is going. And it didn't, in the UK, it really started with Brexit. You know, it was very popular. It was a very popular, big, easy decision. In Australia, we're still, we're also confronting with these sorts of strange topics. You know, just this week, a member of parliament was seriously putting forward that you can reduce grocery prices, but also pay farmers more. I only did economics 101 at uni. Perhaps the answer to that puzzle is in, in second year, but it doesn't make sense to me. So it's politicians, leaders have a responsibility when talking to the public to be truthful and to offer sensible solutions rather than, you know, just crazy things that just don't make sense. I think you're right. I, I think uh, uh, protectionism is about saying we've had it good and now you're talking about changing and we don't want to change anymore. We want to just sort of stay the way it was. But the way it was was change. It's like this strange irony about the whole the whole situation. What does it mean for Australia? Have you got any sort of initial thoughts? Is this going to have an impact on uh, the CBAM suggestions out of EU? Is it going to have a problem for AUKUS uh, with the UK? Any, any early thoughts? Well, our democracy, of course, is different in that we have compulsory voting, which is why we always end up with a centralist um, mm. parliament mm. eventually. Um, of course, there's ex- extremities, and people in Australia do like rebels. I mean, you know, Jackie Lambie is, is one. Everyone likes so- someone who's on the outer, but fundamentally, pe- the, the parties of government are those who are centralist. So, what I mean, you can uh, see. I think there's a good point when, when we talk about the Australian Labor Party, for example, that is different from the British Labor Party. The Labor Party yeah. in uh, the UK is is more on the further along the spectrum than than the ALP. Yeah. 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 Before, and our structure is different. I mean, on ba- and on both sides, yeah. Yeah, and if you look at what's happening in the US with Biden, you know, they're really stuck because their structure really doesn't enable them to, to swap people around as much, um, whereas in Australia, <laughs> we're probably a bit too free and easy with swapping people around. I think it's already affecting industry policy and um, economic policy, and, and I'll tell you why. So last week... My favourite Islamic holiday happened, which is Eid al-Adha. Eid al-Adha celebrates a story from the Old Testament in the Bible when Abraham was asked by God to either kill his son or God would kill all his people. And as he prepared to kill his son, Jacob, um, God said, thank you for being so obedient and here is a goat to kill instead. And in the Islamic tradition, they really celebrate the story with slaughtering goats and then cooking them and, and cele- you know, having a family celebration. It's, it's a wild and great, um, great celebration. The reason why I think it's such an important holiday and it's a great holiday, number one, it's a story that's in the, in the, the religious texts of all three major religions, Christianity, Judaism and Islam. We all hmm. come from the Old Testament. That's something that linked us. But it's also the start of training under the Judeo-Christian tradition, training the human race to think of the least worst choice. The least worst choice was killing his son Uh instead of letting the whole people die. Everything from the trolley problem to Harry Potter and Dumbledore deciding Harry had to die in order to save the whole magical world. You know, all these stories Mm -hmm. in popular Mm -hmm. culture right across has been training us as a society, how do you make the least worst choice? Safety's choice. Yeah, exactly. And if you look at a speech, by Stephen Kennedy, who's our uh, the Secretary of the Treasury Department in the, in Australia, to the US Study Centre, and we'll put this link as homework. It's really clear that Treasury has already made that least worst choice. So Australia has always been on the forefront of open and liberal trade. You know, we've reduced all our tariff barriers, we've reduced a lot of our protectionism, and all of a sudden now, future made in Australia, it looks like we're just turning all that upside down. And for those like me who have, you know, for 20-odd years been working in this environment, believing in it, advocating for it, it, it's a bit of a cognitive dissonance. When you read that speech, you understand that the government and particularly Treasury have thought, okay, the world is changing, protectionism is rising, there is a lot of geostrategic challenges. You know, as, as we've, we've talked about, and there's a reason for this podcast, there's a whole, whole lot of disruption across the economy what we've always done isn't going to work anymore. We need to do something different. But how do we make the least worst choice? Wow. So wow. least worst choice is 
Don't let industry take hold of it. It has to be from Treasury, so it's still got still got a framework. When you read that speech, you'll see a lot of talk around small yards, high fences. Mm-hmm. So those critical technologies that we want to protect. So you know, in terms of supporting renew like renewable energy, batteries, critical minerals, etc., they are getting protection. So it's not the whole economy getting protection. It's a small section, but it is it's deep. No, it's it's no. small yard. Fences. So the, uh, the the elections around the world are going to have an impact on on us, uh, uh, which is actually a really nice segue into the next question that I thought we should address: is, is what's happening with Future Made in in Australia? Uh, I, I asked you, I think last episode, is this a policy or is this a a, a step policy? Where where are you landing at the moment? What's going on with Future Made in Australia? Well. Um- the day we were recording this, yesterday um, the bills were introduced to Parliament. What's most interesting is that they were introduced by Chalmers, the Treasurer, and that's because I don't think it, people are talking about it as industry policy. I don't think it's industry policy. It's economic transition policy and because this is an economic transition that the whole country needs to make. The Treasurer and Treasury need to be in charge one, because they want to make sure we don't un- un- undercut all the good work we've done in the past, but also it's a whole economy. It's not about business making a few batteries and, and or a few renewables. It's a whole range of decisions that have to be made in every department, you know, from environment and industry, um, communications, digital, economics, you know, the way um, business is structured, everything. Everything has to be adjusted. To reflect this new world, yeah, it, it it feels like what you're saying, and I think it makes sense. Is that uh, we need to change our whole economy because we need to find get, get we have to get to a post carbon world. We have international commitments, and it's the right thing to do. But meanwhile, around the world, uh, other countries are, are struggling with it as well, and and we're having this era of no clarity anywhere. We're having real trouble putting it all together. Is that is that a, a sort of like a good summary, or is it too simple? No, no, I think that's right, and I think that's why we're, we've, you know, those looking closely might feel that we've sort of stagnated in our efforts to address net zero and, and get into those targets. And that's simply because companies can't do it as on a volunteer basis. They've got responsibilities to shareholders mm. or stakeholders, to the employees. They've got to make money. They can't just make decisions um, unilaterally. And make themselves uncompetitive. And you can see now globally really big companies who made big claims about where they're going to be on net zero are quietly reducing the communication on that. In the US, ESG is, is now apparently a bad word and, you know, you should never mention it in your company report. And this is because governments just aren't stepping up. They're not willing to make these tougher choices and tell their voters that, that things have to change. We all seem to think that we'll get to net zero without any pain. That's not going to, that's just, isn't true. It's not going to be the case. And this lack of regulatory coherence around the world on that transition to net zero is going to really be the big problem on how companies can adjust because, you know, why, why should you choose a more expensive way of manufacturing your packaging if your competitors don't? It's, um, it's some, some, Mind-boggling challenges ahead, and business is not going to get it any easier. Uh, there was some uh, some movement on future made in Australia regarding uh, the issue we talked about last uh, month. Uh, guarantee of origin is that guarantee of origin? Is that the right term? What's going on with it? Yeah, guarantee of origin. So it's that thirty-two million dollar part of the the twenty-seven billion in future made in Australia. Um, yeah, so there's, I understand the treasurer's race out at the G20 and this, and trying to get our trading partners to sort of agree. Because until we, until we have a mechanism to really trace those products that are made using renewable energy and a, a lower carbon footprint, there's not going to be any value to. Yeah, just to frame that. So a hydrogen could come from anywhere. Hydrogen's hydrogen. It's just a, uh, I think you called it a fungible product. Uh, so. Mm. Uh, it could be made somewhere bad. It could be made somewhere good. What we're looking for, we as Australians, trying to say, let's figure out a way in which we can say, no, this is good. This is good hydrogen. Yeah. Well, and critical minerals. So a lot of critical minerals are processed in China. 
um, and other places that don't have the same rigour around environmental regulations, labour rights, etc. So if you're buying a battery that's a bit cheaper, is it cheaper because someone's been really efficient in the way they're making it or, or because you know, all these um, negative impacts have happened along the supply chain? So if Australia is going to be in a position where we are forced to charge a premium for adhering to all those rules and regulations, how does how do we get that benefit? How does a consumer um, have that guarantee of origin? The guarantee of origin, it is really difficult with the fungible products, but it already exists with blood diamonds, paddock to plate on beef. You know, there's a few frameworks that we can use. Uh, which is, a, again, another nice segue into the next issue we should talk about, which is circular economy. There's been a, quite a bit going on in circular economy. Uh, I recently in the tr- in interviewed Brendan O'Keefe on my other supply chain podcast called Supply Circles. Uh, Brendan is an expert on circular supply chains, and he said the the problems facing circularity is we need a definition, and it's all about the design. It's the beginning of the process, not halfway through the process. And the fact that the public needs to be educated beyond just the idea of of recycling um, in the circular economy, which is a bit bigger than the circular supply chain, it seems like this conversation has uh, has been uh, has been happening for a while. But there's been a bit of movement in policy area. Is that right? Yes. So the government's just recently released their blueprint for a national circular economy framework, and. Um, you know, it's it's quite good, I have to say. Um, there's some realistic stretch goals, but, you know, we always want more detail on the metrics to, to track progress. I think um, one of the challenges, while design is absolutely essential on circular economy, because we are such an open and diversified economy, we actually import a lot of our products. So we don't really have a lot of control at the design stage because we're, we're, we're sort of the product takers. Um, so that means that unfortunately the government does focus a lot on post-consumption. So, you know, what do you do with the waste or, or, or end of life products? Um, which then adds burden to both consumers and businesses. I think though, this is where it comes down to Australia can't operate by itself. We need to work with our trading partners. We need to have some guidelines. I mean, one of the things with free trade agreements, for example, packaging is excluded in country of origin calculations. Oh. So there is absolutely no motivation for a company to invest in better packaging to environmentally sustainable packaging, et cetera, et cetera, because there is not, you don't get an added, you know, you, there's no tick in terms of market access on that. So I think there's, it's not just, as I said, it's not just Department of Environment having to deal with it or Department of Industry, but also Department of Trade. We should be really looking at all our free trade agreements to see how we can support these circular economy principles within them. It, it, so interestingly, that means that a product made in country A that is then shipped to country B for packaging and finalisation is then shipped to Australia and sold and we end up with the waste. It is yeah. <laughs> Well, or conversely, we export a lot of waste. So, so I think of the high-end, um, you know, vitamins, um, skin care, processed food, these are all, really our big winners on free trade agreements. So we're sending a whole lot of plastics overseas oh, wow. and there's no, no real rules on that other than, you know, unless the domestic economy has rules, mm-hmm. in which case then it's problematic. So I think, in, as I say, individual countries trying to address these things separately is not helpful. We really need all economies to be working together. We can already see now with New Zealand and their plastics policy, it's already affecting Australian companies. And New Zealand, you know, is our oldest free trade agreement partner. We should be far more integrated than we are. We have high ambition for integration, but it's these separate rules that are really making um, it challenging. And, you know, bread bags, for example. Bread bags are, are not that particularly expensive because bread is not expensive, but if you make them expensive, then you're going to make bread expensive. Yeah, right. So, you know, unless we, we can think sensibly about this, um, it's going to affect consumers. I, I did ask uh, a food manufacturer why they use plastic, and and, and she said because it's by far the best product to move food around. It's, yeah. it's by far it's the best one. Well, 
And again, this is the, the least worst choice. Do you have higher food wastage because of spoilage or do you use plastic so the food lasts longer? Right. Yeah. See, this is a, <laughs> um, this is a good and, argument. <laughs> that, that's right. It's a theme. It's a theme. It's it's, and I think now more than ever, as a human race, we need to be thinking: what is the least worst choice? Um, the other thing with food packaging, in particular, and, and skin care, etc., they're really limited on what they can use for recycled materials because it's not always suitable mm. because they're not they don't have the same strength, they don't have the same performance. Yeah. Um, as virgin um, material-made products. So uh, given that they are such high users of plastics, it's not an easy answer. On the on the positive side, though, KitKat has started putting their product into a, re, a renewable packaging, so we should all eat a lot of KitKats. I'll take that on board yeah. myself. But there has been some uh, move in the waste export program, though. Now, I'm not quite sure what this is. Do, have you come across this is where – companies apply to be able to export their waste. Yes. So this, some people might remember a few years ago, it was even before COVID when um, China and other mm. countries said, look, with Australia, we're sick of taking all your waste. Yeah, keep it. You know, stop doing it. And, you know, we did need to improve our game because we, we weren't sorting things properly, et cetera. And it's really just exporting our problems. Um, so that was – um, addressed and now there's a lot more regulation and it's not quite the same level as defence exports but it's pretty close in that you have to prove that you're sending it to someone who you know, can sensibly and responsibly take care of the, the waste if you are exporting it. There was um, a proposal at some stage to tax those exports as if that would somehow introduce a new industry. Um, we, along with other associations, really fought hard against it and were pleased to say in the, economy, in the um, budget that we were successful. Number one, export tariffs are illegal under the WTO. And so that's what I mean. Even departments can't just make decisions that are not within our international rules. We can't just throw everything in the bin. Yeah. We've got to stick to some basic rules. So export um, tariffs are illegal. But also, I don't. I've never seen a, uh, an example where we've taxed an industry into existence. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, the, 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 so there are service fees. So, so put a I service mean, fee in rather than a tariff. Clever. Yeah. So there, well, there was going to be tariffs and a service fee. So the service fee is because some, you know, some bureaucrat has to check that you're sending it to a responsible person, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So there is some there is some work and admin. To be done, so it is a cost recovery model. Uh, it's not cheap, though. Twenty thousand, I think, for an export license. Uh, Thirteen thousand mm -hmm. for a variation. So they found a way around this tricky one, yeah. And it applies to a whole bunch of stuff: tires, plastic, glass, paper, cardboard, a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. So um, you better get some good advice on on that. I would suggest. Do, do we do much work in this area? In circular economy and waste. Yeah. Oh yes, we well we do a lot. So Molly Knox, who um, I think it opens up your Supply Circles podcast. She does. That's um, the voice, the voice the at the least. Circles, yeah. <laughs> so Molly is our lead on that. Molly and I are also involved in the Product Stewardship Centre of Excellence. I'm on the board, and that's about um, lifting the whole product stewardship industry. So, you know, think of all those like mobile muster, tyres, batteries, etc. There's a whole range of product stewardship schemes. So how do we make sure that they're are effective, aren't onerous for business, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we're, there's a lot of activity right now on waste, circular economy, product stewardship, because this is really an important part of our net zero journey is how do we reduce our carbon footprints by designing products better, dealing with the waste better, dealing with the longevity of products, et cetera, et cetera. I think um, people who want a bit of a, a grounding on that should listen to an old podcast that you did with Rachel Wilkinson. Wilkinson, yeah, yeah, in yeah, episode um, two or three, I think it was quite early, uh, and we replayed yeah. it. And there's also one on the product stewardship with uh, John, I think. Oh, with John. Yeah, yeah. So you know, yeah. head over to Supply Circles, everybody. After this, head over to Supply Circles. Have a listen. Um, we should talk about privacy reforms and uh, AI. There's a bit of change there as well. 
Yeah, so there's um, we've been warning about this for some time, and I think that's this was the homework for, for last week was to look at our submission on the privacy reform. So last month, rather, um, the legislation will be coming to Parliament this session, so very soon, I think. Um, the big change for people is at the moment there are 81,000 Australian businesses covered by the privacy legislation and the numbers are unclear yet, but it looks like it would be either all companies or certainly more than the 80,000. So there's still talk that perhaps some really small companies might be exempt, perhaps under 20 employees, but there's still a big gap, you know, that, that is still going to be captured. The other big thing too that change is that employee records will be captured, which they're not now. And, um, you know, it's much, it's making our privacy laws far more aligned to GDPR, the European model, which is onerous, really difficult. Um, those members who I've spoken to, I, I said to them, would you prefer to do GDPR again or walk across a floor with Lego and bare feet? And they said, oh, Lego with bare feet, definitely. <laughs> Um, so, yeah. look, watch out for it. We, we will be doing more advocacy and awareness raising and making sure that members are kept up to date on, on what they'll need to do. But there will be change. Yeah. You will need to have a data security plan, data management plan, a data officer potentially in your business. Um, yeah, I, I can see that. One of the things um, that the government has done, which I hope will help, is create the new digital ID. And that, that legislation um, went through a few weeks ago. So everyone already has a digital ID if you have a Gov ID, a Gov ID account, you know, my Gov account. And the digital ID means that um, you can verify your identity with a service provider, provider Optus, the bank, health insurance, etc., without actually handing over the, the real details of your passport, your driver's license, etc. So if there is a breach, all that data is not compromised. Wow. So it's really important as part of this digital economy that we start to think seriously about how much data we hand out mm. into the world and, importantly for companies, how much data we hold and what personal data. Yeah. Because it's not if you have a breach, it will be when, and then when that happens, what damage you're causing to your customers and your suppliers. Yeah, wow. Wow. Uh, all these issues are... Uh, uh ongoing, aren't they? I mean, the thing about industry policy and part of what this podcast is all about is the fact that it's not just you get <laughs> go to work, you address something, you, you close it off and put it away. There's just this ongoing work. And so listeners shouldn't be overly concerned about all of this. It's just that it's complex and that we're doing a lot of work with it on behalf of members. That's right. So a lot of stuff that we do won't even ever get to members because fortunately we've stopped it at the past. <laughs> we've managed to change things or adjust things and have lots of conversations. Um, you know, the, the payment times legislation is a good example. So um, there's been a bit of coverage. There is new legislation that means that if big businesses don't pay small businesses fast enough, they'll be named and shamed. And initially um, the, the legislation said, well, if it's just 30 days, a flat 30 days. So if you pay, if you're in the top bottom 10%, even if you pay within 30 days, it can be named and shamed by the minister. We made the point that in all industries are different. There's industry norms that are different. 30 days isn't appropriate for all industries. Some have much longer sales times and, and payment times, construction, et cetera. So we were successful in getting that clause in there. And then we also worked um, with members of the opposition for another amendment, which that said that those companies who do pay quickly um, should be rewarded. And so in, not just name and shame, but name and celebrate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so those, and, and then as a big company, you'll be able to say, well, look, I'm credentialed as a, a good payer. But that for us isn't enough. You know, we're industry development and policy. So that's the policy side. So what do we do on the industry development side? What we're going to do now is work with our members, um, to talk about, uh, invoicing hygiene, how you get paid faster by, by improving the way you send your invoice. Because here's a tip. Attaching a PDF to an email is not e-invoicing. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. That you may as well be sending it snail mail. E-invoicing is having machine-to-machine -machine communications mm. with your data, which means you'll get paid faster. So we'll run some sessions with our big members and small members to really lift that up and lift up this uptake of e-invoicing and the general digitalization of the economy. A, a, a lot of what we have in place is based on history 
You know, we uh, have very slow accounting systems, slow banking systems, etc. I worked for a, a company called May Nicholas, which is an Australian transport company in express freight. And it started off on the Melbourne docks. And uh, the, the history book after 100 years, they wrote a book of 100 years of May Nicholas, and they called it Hurry Back because when they first started, they used to say they go on the horse and cart, go down the docks, get, get this load and hurry back. Uh, by the time I was there, we, we were doing international freight on on, on jets, you know. So, but our accounting systems haven't kept up, so it's good to see this sort of work happening uh, and in the background to make it easier for all of us. We're going to have to go. What a busy month! It looks like next month's going to be equally busy. Uh, keep an eye on the uh, international elections and see what happens. Our homework today is to read the Kennedy. Uh, speech. speech. So that's the treasurer, the treasury secretary. Um, so we'll put that link in. But also, we've we've put a survey out into the marketplace asking companies for their, to understand their use of technology. Um, we'll put that link in there. We really want as many companies to contribute as possible because we want to uncover what are the gaps, what are we doing well, uh, and that will really help us in our industry development advocacy. You know, if there are distinct gaps, particularly in AI, in the take-up of AI in certain sectors, then what can we do to step in and, and lift that for everyone's productivity? Yeah, maybe one of the things we'll talk about in future is this emerging supply chain terminology called operational technology, which is different from information technology. Information is technology is the data that runs your business. Operational technology is AI, robots, whatever that, that runs your operations, and it's starting to separate into two, but both need to be p- protected. We have to go. We're way over time. Thanks again, Louise. Have a good month. Thanks, James. That's it for this episode of Debrief. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed the show, remember to like and subscribe, and please tell others about the show. Feel encouraged to view our posts on LinkedIn. Go to my page or Louise's or Australian Industry Group, and please share the post about the show to your co- uh, connections and networks. And as we always say, if you are as opinionated as we are, please give us feedback or send a question or comment to industry.policy at aigroup.com.au and we'll talk next month.